So, as you might suppose, as I'm standing here, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And the call to the gospel is an important one. One is supposed to be accompanied by absolute surrender to the Lord. Apostle Paul says in Romans 12 that he admonishes us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then he says, which is your reasonable service. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. A sacrifice is usually killed. Its life is forfeit to the one to whom the sacrifice is made. The problem with living sacrifices, as it has been said many times, is that they keep crawling off of the altar. We're not very willing living sacrifices. And we're not cooperative with God. So this is how it goes. Oh God, I surrender to you my life. I love you, Lord, you're the greatest. And then I'm faced with a difficulty. I'm faced with a, a, a circumstances I didn't expect. And then my commitment is questioned. Why? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. First, the world around us is pressuring us to go this way, not the Lord's way. Yes. Sometimes when we live surrender to the Lord, it's a rebuke to those who are around us. And they accuse us of being something that we're not. Or, and then sometimes it's even people in the church. When you say, oh, I'm sold out to God, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And people in the church say, what, are you crazy? People in the world, God lays expectations and laws and, and restrictions on our lives. He said, don't do certain things. Don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't do things that you're not supposed to do. But So who is it that tells us, who are you to tell me what to do? What kind of self-righteous person are you? What kind of God would tell me what to do if I'm not going to be happy? I mean, it's all about my happiness, right? And we have an adversary. I don't know if you believe in an adversary, but I certainly do. Um, I don't believe in the one that, that gets portrayed with, you know, in a red suit and cloven hooves and pointy tail and a pitchfork in his hand and horns, but those were that was the way of, uh, of people in the Middle Ages resisting the devil because they knew that the devil was an angel of, of, of glory and beauty, and so they made fun of him. They lampooned him, and so people look today and they say, oh, they look at those paintings and they say, look at the stupid things these people in the church believe. They think that the devil looks like this. That's not what the devil looks like. He probably is a very handsome fellow. Unfortunately, he's a liar. And he's against you. And then, I don't think the fact that God is spirit helps. He's invisible. And he doesn't always communicate with us in ways that are audible. So, it's just hard to trust, to have faith in these situations. You know, you hear people rail against God. Oh, God, he's not there. You know, they, they say he doesn't have any claim on their lives. But have you ever been around somebody who was talking trash about somebody and then the person they were talking trash about showed up? <laughs> and they shut up? <laughs> or all hugs and kisses. Yeah, yeah, it was all hugs and kisses. That's exactly the way it's going to be when we all stand before God. All these people who've been talking about this and that, and I'm gonna live my life the way I want, I got no regrets, you can't tell me what to do, and that's old, that's old outmoded religion, that's a bunch of baloney. Oh, isn't it amazing that God is so compassionate that he withholds his judgment, and sometimes the consequences of our disobedience. But people even presume upon that. They even think, well, you know, I remember when I was a boy, the first time I ever took the Lord's name in vain, I really had told my friends, you shouldn't do that. And then probably six or eight months later, I did it. 
And I really expected the Lord to do something, strike me, and nothing happened. But my biggest reason is that I just don't trust God. I'm afraid that if I trust the Lord to direct the course of my life, that my life will not be as good as that kind of a life that I can make for myself. This is my struggle, and I believe it's the struggle of many people. People who have sex outside of marriage. People who have sex with others inside the context of marriage. People who don't honor their fathers and mothers. People who follow all the cultural things of the society with the hair and, the, and everything else that people do. This is a trusting in flesh. This is a trusting in our intellect. This is a trusting in our experience. And it is not what we are called as believers to do. We're called to trust in God. There was a little old lady who used to come to this church. Her name was Ruth Kelly. She said, I was afraid when I was a young person that if I trusted God and I surrendered to him that he'd make me a missionary in Africa with all those bugs and snakes and crawling ugly things. And I didn't want to do that. I was afraid. And I guess it's, it's not... Um, such an uncommon thing that people would say, well, if I deliver my life completely, God is going to make me a priest or a nun or a missionary or I'm not going to have any fun or whatever. That's, that's kind of the idea, you know. There was even a song that was written a few years back that said, please don't send me to Africa. I don't think that I got what it takes. I'm just a man. I'm not a Tarzan. Don't like lions, gorillas, or snakes. I'll serve you here in suburbia in my comfortable middle class life. Oh, please don't send me out into the bush where the natives are restless at night. Yeah, well. You never heard that song before? I think you wrote it. Now, I don't know where the Lord may send you or what He may do in your life if you surrender completely to Him, but I can tell you. It'll be better from what you can think of. And it'll probably not be something that is against your personality. So this particular message that I'm with today grows out of me memorizing Psalm 34. Memorizing and meditating on it. I, I happened across that scripture, 34.1, that says... Um, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Continually. That means often. That means it happens over and over again. I will bless the Lord at all times. So I'll live my life in a way that blesses the Lord. His praise shall continually be, be in my mouth. And then I thought, well, I need to probably put it in its context. So I went ahead and memorized the rest of the psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. I'm not going to recite the whole thing because it's kind of long. But I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be my, in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me out of all my fears. They looked at him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions shall lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. It goes on to say, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. So these verses got me thinking about my relationship with God. We've got, we've got this trust issue that, that the psalmist is dealing with here. And I realized that I just... Don't trust him very well. So I decided to look for some other verses in the scripture about what it says about trusting God. So I, I came to Proverbs 
eleven twenty eight. You know, we like to trust in other things besides the Lord. And it says in Psalm and Proverbs eleven twenty eight, He who trusts in his riches will fall. The righteousness will flourish like foliage. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Proverbs 16, 20. He, whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. How about this famous one? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And there's Psalm 84, 10 to 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is a man who trusts in you. Or how about Jeremiah 17? 7 and 8. Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its root by the river and will not fear when he comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease from fruit. Psalm 40 verses 1 through 4. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Or how about Isaiah 26, 3 and 4? You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. Or Psalm 37, 4. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You can find many, 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 many scriptures. I could, we could be here all day. With that, but you probably throw rocks at me, so we won't do that anymore. So we would do well to heed these instructions to trust in the Lord and accept the witness of the scriptures, for He'll not lead us into harm or difficulties. Now, I thought I would, as I thought about this, I thought I would illustrate this from a couple of people in the scriptures who trusted the Lord. One of them was Abram. We've been studying Genesis in the Sunday school class that I attend. And one of them, and, and, and so we just are talking about Abram right now. And we, we read about Lot today, but we've, we've had several chapters on Abram. And if you recall, Abram, he was 75 years old when God came to him and gave him the promise and said, you're going to have a son, you and Sarai are going to have a son. And all the nations of the world are going to be blessed through this son. 75. All right. But then it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. And when, nine, when he was 99 years old, God appears to him and says to him, it's coming this year. And Abraham laughs at himself and says, I'm going to be 100 years old. I'm going to become a dad. And he gives Abram instructions. And he tells Abram to take all the men of his household and to circumcise them as a sign of the covenant that God has established with Abram. And you know what it says? It says, So Abram took Ishmael his son and all who were born in his house and circumcised them on that very same day. And what is his reputation? He's the father of the faith. He's the father of the faithful. He's the one that we look to as a person who trusted God. He obeyed immediately. I thought of the apostle Peter. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 in Mark chapter 9 or 4 in Matthew 
chapter 14 we read. And Jesus dismisses the crowd, goes up on a, on a mountain to pray, and he sends the disciples out across the Sea of Galilee, and they're having a hard time because the wind was against them. It was at night. It was a storm. And they were having trouble. So he goes to them walking on the water. And it says that they saw him and thought he was a ghost. But he says, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And then Peter says, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he says, come. So Peter gets down out of the boat and walks on the water to go to Jesus. He obeyed him. He did what the Lord said. But what happens? When Peter saw the wind was boisterous, and I can imagine it was kind of like this walking on the wind. And he's thinking to himself, what am I doing out here? And he takes his eyes off the Lord. And what happens? He sinks. He sinks. It says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, as long as Peter trusted in the Lord, as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, what happened in his life was miraculous. And as soon as he turns his eyes away, not good. He sings. Trusting in God is important for us if we don't want to sink. There is a fellow whose son, if you remember in Mark 9, whose son was always being thrown into the fire or thrown into the water. He had this, this unclean spirit and he brought his son to the disciples to heal him, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus says to the fellow, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes, and immediately the father responds, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Oh, Lord, help our unbelief. Help my unbelief. Help me not to believe a false saying. Help me to trust in you, Lord. How we need that. We need help because of our unbelief. I, I reminded of this story of Daniel, the prophet, and his three classmates, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're told that everybody has to bow down to this golden idol of King Nebuchadnezzar or else. So they don't bow down. And then the question becomes, or else what? It says that he's going to heat up this furnace and he's going to throw them into it. And they said, you can do that if you want to. And our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, or as the famous quote is, but if not, no, it will still not bow down. So he gets mad, and he heats up the furnace, and he throws them in, and nothing happens. As a matter of fact, the Lord is with them in the furnace, and he calls to them and says, come out. And they come out, the three of them, not the fourth one. He marvels at them. And he makes a decree. And he says, Blessed is the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their God. When we walk in faith, when we trust the Lord, other people, Notice. So, I thought I would share some times in my life where I've actually got it right. I actually trusted the Lord, and He blessed me. And I have to remember these things, because if I don't remember these things, as a friend of mine says, I have a good forgetter, and I'm tempted to turn aside. I'm tempted to look at the wind and the waves. I'm tempted to think, well, if I can just Work this out for my own self here. Maybe I can, maybe I can make it better. So, we used to take groups from this church down to a seminar in Miami. So I went to law school uh, in 1983, and 
one of the things they tell you when you go to law school is they pretend you're going to a foreign country. Tell your family to pretend you're in a foreign country. You just can't pop by and visit. You just can't call up and, and get a hold of them real easy. That was before we had all this connectedness that we have with the internet and cell phones and all that. And so that's what we did. We had this week-long seminar. It was 7 to 10, Monday through Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday. So would I go? Would I, would I take the youth? Would I participate with that? Jennifer and I prayed about that. And we said, okay, we'll do it. Even though it was like a giant test of faith. So we went. The end of the first semester, I was number one in the class. I had a law firm after I got out. And the law firm, one of the guys quit working. Had a nervous breakdown or whatever. And so we had three main breadwinners in the, in the law firm. And, and one of them quit working, so you can imagine it was bad. And the law firm ended up dissolving. So I tried to get in three or four of the big firms. I had great talks with all of them. But one by one, the Lord closed this door, closed that door. He closed them all. And I was like, Lord, what are you doing here? I got this big case. And I need help. So I said, I guess this is what your will is for me. So I went on my own. And I was a solo. I've been a solo now a long time, 27 years. It's been great. We won the big case that I had that was there. Uh, God took care of me. That was, it was funny. We had one of the cases that we had and there was a, of a I was representing Port Everglades before it was dissolved, and then I later represented the county. And even the county commissioner said, who is this little solo practitioner guy representing Broward County against this big law firm and this, you know, these, all these people? I guess I didn't know any better. But we won the case. We got money. It's a beautiful thing. You know, one of the areas where it's hard for people to trust God is in the area of, of money. And um, I think in some ways uh, in the church, it's been misrepresented. Uh, the whole idea of giving and why you give and all those things. But I was challenged a few years back to give more. Give an extra percent every year. Give an extra percent every year. So, that's been a challenge, but it's been more than 10 years, and God has continued to take care of me. He's continued to provide for my needs. He's continued to bless me, and I have been able to bless others. I have been able to sow into the work of the kingdom. We had a, a, a situation one time where one of our kids had a relationship with a girl, one of our boys. And Jennifer and I didn't think that the girl was the right one for him. But he thought it was. So we were at odds with one another. And we made our case, and it wasn't getting any better. It was just getting worse. It was just conflict after conflict after conflict. And I was spending time with the Lord, and I said, Lord, how do you want me to do this? And I really just felt like God said, you know, you can't, if you can't talk to your son, you can't influence him. And you have to trust me to work in a situation. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll trust you to work in a situation. went to the son and said, it's your choice. It's your life. You marry the girl, it's fine. We'll make the best of it. And we love you. And he didn't marry her. It was very interesting. 
We think if we trust God, he'll mess up our lives. But he calls us to surrender to him and to trust him. And we just go part way. I can tell you today that the times that I have trusted the Lord in my life, the times when I've really laid down my own will, I've laid down my own ideas, and I've done what I believe that God was calling me to do, those are the times I've been blessed the most in my life. Why is it such a struggle to trust God? All those reasons, I said. There's the world. There's my flesh. We have an adversary. God's invisible. All those reasons. But I suppose if you go around the room and you talk to people who have, who have had experiences with God, that time and again, that they would say, when I trusted the Lord, when I finally let go and said, God, I can't do it anymore. You're going to have to... Work this situation out. That's when God miraculously does. He doesn't. But we have to let go. We have to have faith enough to trust that he knows what he's talking about in the scriptures. We have, have faith enough to believe that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not with him freely give us all things? He's a good God. He loves you. He has your best interest in mind. God says, don't commit adultery. Don't commit sexual immorality. How many couples live together before they get married? How many people feel like the little pornography on the side is just okay? If we will trust God in this area, he will bless us. We don't need to engage in that. That's taking matters in our own hands. The Lord says each one should keep his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Is it easy? No. But is it worth it? Absolutely, yes. God's ways are better than our ways. God's ways bless us and bless those who are around us. And they don't destroy our witness with others. We don't have to guess. We don't have to make our own plans. We don't have to figure everything out. How about, have you ever lied on an application or written something that wasn't true in order to get a job or a loan? Or have you ever taken something maybe from somebody who had more than you and you thought, well, they got a lot. The Bible says don't bear false witness. When we, when we bear false witness in a work situation, we're, we're lying. We're doing what God tells us not to do. Maybe it's not the job God wants you to have. Maybe God doesn't want you to have that thing that you took. How about money? Who owns your money? How did you get it? You see, we think that God blesses us to increase our standard of living, when in fact he blesses us to increase our standard of giving. But we gotta, if we give that money away, we won't be able to buy this, and we won't be able to have that, and we won't, and, 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 and because we don't trust God, and he knows what he's doing, that he can take care of us. After all, he's invisible. I'm telling you right now that the struggle to trust God is real. 
I hear amen about that. Amen. It is. It's real. But brothers and sisters, there is no better thing. <coughs> if we trust him, we will be blessed. You know, there's a fellow in the Bible by the name of Job. Job had a tough time. I wouldn't want to have been Job. Had ten kids that were killed in one day. All of his stuff was taken. All his camel, sheep, goats, donkeys, everything that he had, gone. And then afflicted with boils. In sorrow and despair. And then his wife, who says to him, Why are you holding on to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Great counsel. But you know, in the end, Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Amen. You know, God restored everything to Job and more. Job was better off in the end than he was in the beginning because he learned to trust God. Beloved, John talked about it, the Bible study on Friday night. There's a very famous C.S. Lewis quote. It's not that Christianity has been tried and found lacking. It's that it's never really been tried at all. You see, we stick our toe in the water to see how it's like, you know, and then we jump back. Or we get it up to our knees and we come back out. Because we're afraid that we can't swim or, or God won't take care of us. I don't know what we're afraid of. I have no idea. We think that if we let God have control of our lives, then he'll mess them up. He'll send us to Africa. <laughs> if we do life God's way, we won't be happy. We'll never get married. We won't get a good job. We'll always be living with our parents. <laughs> ah! <laughs> She'll never change. He'll never change. I'll have to bear this the rest of my life. Don't count God out. God is big. It's bigger than any problem that we have. He's bigger than the circumstances that we face. He's bigger, as one of those kids' songs says, than the boogeyman. But we have to trust him, beloved. God cannot do the work in your life. He cannot do the work in a person's life unless we trust him. As long as we keep taking matters into our own hands, as long as we keep trying to help God out or help ourselves out, We will not experience his blessings. We will not experience his provision and all that he has for us. I think that I want to have all that God wants for me. I don't always see it in the beginning when something happens that this somehow is, is good. I don't always see it. And it's not everything that happens to me is good. But I know this. And I believe the witness of the scripture is that if we will trust God, if we will give all these things to him, even the difficult and the bad things, even the impossible circumstances and situations, if we will give those things to him and if we will surrender our lives to him, we will be blessed. Our lives will work out. And they'll be better than the lives that we can manufacture for ourselves. So witness of the scriptures. Over and over and over again. That's the witness of the scriptures. So my challenge to you, to me, today, is will you trust God? Have you, have you wandered away? Have you gotten off of the path? Are you taking matters into your own hands? Do you feel like that you have to do it this way because 
After all, I got bills to pay, I got this to do, I got. Only you know that. Only you know what's going on in between your two ears. Only you know what's going on in your life. But, beloved, let us, let us learn to trust the Lord. Let us walk with Him together and experience what He has for us.